Warm good evening to all. We have gathered here for the TANWAS Global Veterinary Imaging Sciences Webinar Series 2020. Now may I request Dr. S. Bal Subramaniam, Director of Clinics, Tamil Nadu Veterinary Animal Sciences University for the introduction on webinar. A warm good evening to the participants and good morning to the speaker. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. C. Balachandran, Dean, Dr. K. N. Selvakumar, Madras Veterinary College, Deans of Constituent Veterinary Colleges of Tanuvas, Heads of the Department, Dr. Nagarajan, Provost and Head Department of Clinics, Dr. Krishna Kumar. A very warm uh, good evening to one and all. See, this Directorate of uh, Clinics is organizing this Global Veterinary Imaging Sciences webinar on very specialized area on radiography and ultrasonography. So, at the outset, I would like to thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor, who is the pillar of support, who has given the unstinted support for organizing this webinar. So, we have earlier uh, organized webinars for uh, students, for our constituent colleges, and later we have uh, expanded this uh, webinar at global level. So, the complete support uh, has been extended by our Honorable Vice Chancellor. And I thank uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor uh, uh, in this occasion. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Natasha Moto uh, for this webinar. Uh, she is going to deliver on radiographic anatomy of the abdomen of uh, in uh, dogs and cats. So, with this very brief introduction, uh, I welcome you all for this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I request our respected and honorable Vice Chancellor of Tamil Nadu Veterinary Animal Sciences University, Dr. C. Balachandran, for the inaugural address. Greetings from Tamil Nadu Veterinary and Animal Sciences uh, University. Uh, with me here are the uh, organizing secretary, uh, Dr. S. Balasubramaniam, the director of clinics, the Dean of Madras Veterinary College, Dr. K. N. Selvakumar, the Professor and Head Department of uh, Clinics, Dr. L. Nagarajan, and my other colleagues from different uh, institutes, our uh, honored uh, international uh, speaker, Dr. Natasha Mutum, and Professor and Head Department of Veterinary Gynecology and Obstetrics, Dr. K. Krishna Kumar, and uh, all the beloved uh, participants. So, good evening and good morning. So, this uh, university has got uh, <coughs> four uh, established uh, veterinary colleges and uh, three more are coming up. And of which the Madras Veterinary College is the premier uh, institute uh, nearly 117 years old and it has got uh, state-of-the-art facilities uh, in this part of the country, so which is delivering its goods on diagnosis, treatment, and management of clinical problems. So, <clears throat> coming to the current, today's uh, uh, program on the imaging techniques, so this um, happens right from the discovery of X-rays in 1895. Then medical imaging has gone uh, Way beyond the production of images, now we have options to display, post-process, record, store, and also of transmission of images. And finally, application of picture archiving and the communication system, the packs. So we have one 
such facility is here in Madras Veterinary College. So this is uh, bringing together the science and technology to create uh, visual recording of the interior body structures of biomedical uh, research, clinical examination and medical preposition. So imaging techniques help to establish a standard database of normal anatomical, physiological and functional parameters that could be used for clinical and research purpose. In the clinical context, which includes the X-ray diagnostics, ultrasonography and endoscopy, and X-ray diagnostics normally employ the ionizing radiations X-rays, including projection radiography, fluoroscopy, computer radiography, digital radiography, and computer tomography. So our hospitals are equipped uh, with uh, X-ray facilities, ultrasonography, and computer radiography. And uh, we have recently installed the retrofit digital radiography at Madras Veterinary College. And we have CT, computer tomography facilities at Madras Veterinary College and at Veterinary College and Research Institute uh, Normal Hospitals. So as uh, because of the current trend uh, in India, as uh, new veterinary practices are opening up, particularly as startup clinics, there is increasing installation of imaging equipment. They are now considered as an integral part of the business. Availability of the state-of-the-art and point-of-care ultrasound systems at this university and its experienced faculty are offering faster, more accurate and non-invasive diagnosis as well as early and better identification and management of diseases which were previously difficult to diagnose and treat. So in Tanuas, we just started uh, in a small way on the imaging technology, mainly uh, benefiting our undergraduate and uh, postgraduate students of the university. And four webinars have been conducted since uh, last July. And then following that, uh, it was decided to extend to extend globally, uh, that is uh, involving the recognized experts from different uh, countries. So this has uh, started for the first time in Tanwas, uh, the Global Veterinary Clinical Sciences Webinar in 2020 to begin with um, anemia and blood transfusion medicine in chronic kidney diseases in canines. Uh, was organized uh, just some time back and uh, nearly uh, the, more than uh, 1,600 uh, participated in this uh, from 12 different uh, countries. So then following this, we the Director of Clinics is organizing this Global Veterinary Imaging Sciences Webinar Series 2020 and we are beginning with the uh, review of abdominal radiography in dogs and cats, followed by gastrointestinal ultrasonography in small animal practice. So this is, uh, hope this will help the veterinary undergraduate and postgraduate students, faculty members, field and practicing veterinarians worldwide to provide practical updates and an opportunity to interact with international ex experts. So now I'm happy to know that uh, the organizing committee have has chosen Dr. Natasha Mutu and Dr. Laura Martinelli, the right persons with the expertise in the field of small animal radiology and ultrasonography. So here to uh, briefly uh, say about uh, Dr. Natasha Mutu is uh, hailing from uh, uh, University of West Indies, Trinidad, Tobacco. For, uh, and we welcome Dr. Natasha for this webinar. We will be delivering on review of abdominal radiography in dogs and cats and tomorrow followed by Dr. Lara Martinelli. So I am happy to learn that uh, more than 1,800 uh, 
participants have registered and uh, viewing this program and uh, about 17 uh, they are from 17 different countries and uh, we are happy uh, that uh, this uh, unique platform will impart quality online update on the imaging sciences in radiology and ultrasonography in small animals to wedding budding veterinary students faculties academicians and field and practicing uh, veterinary, veterinarians I'm happy uh, and congratulate the entire team who are organizing this uh, unique uh, global webinar series 2020. I, uh, my, I extend my, once, my, once again my greetings and uh, good wishes to all the uh, participants and also to our guest uh, speaker, Dr. Natasha. I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. So thank you, sir, for the brief and concise address on the webinar and various facilities available at Tanwas. May I request uh, Dr. L. Nagarajan, Professor in the Department of Clinics, Madras Veterinary College, to introduce the speaker of the day. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all who have gathered, gathered across the globe to attend this webinar. I am privileged to um, uh, introduce the speaker, Dr. Uh, Natasha Mutu, who is also my friend. Dr. Natasha Mutu graduated in, uh, in the year 1996, and she has acquired her uh, DVM, and then since then she's been working in uh, the, the School of Veterinary Medicine Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of the West Indies, uh, from 2009 onwards. And uh, she has been, she later she developed a uh, keen interest in radiology and imaging techniques, and uh, then she was trained she sought after training programs in radiology and imaging after that. She was trained under uh, great radiologists like Chris Warren Smith, Christine Gibbs uh, and from the University of Bristol, and then later under Dr. Robert O'Brien from the University of Illinois in USA. And she's been attending various training programs uh, in various uh, uh, countries like England, Australia, and Turkey on imaging techniques and radiology especially. And she's also undergone a training program in uh, CT and MRI at the Toronto uh, Veterinary Medical uh, Emergency Hospital. And she is uh, PenHIP certi certified, which is Pennsylvania uh, Hip Improvement Program, which is certified. Uh, you have to acquire a certified, uh, certificate to do this uh, technique, uh, which is an hip evaluation program for hip dysplasia. She was uh, trained under uh, the legendary Dr. Gail Smith, uh, to acquire this pen hip certificate. And uh, currently she is the consultant for the Rottweiler Association of Trinidad and Tobago uh, for hip evaluation program. And she's also published many papers in peer reviewed journals and presented many abstracts and posters in many conferences all over the globe. Uh, now I invite Dr. Muto to present her webinar on radiographic anatomy of the abdomen. Over to Dr. Muto, please. Good morning or good evening to all. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Dr. Nagarajan. Uh, today I'm talking to you from the islands of uh, Trinidad and Tobago in the Southern Caribbean, quite away from you here in India. Uh, that being said, we meet today to talk about one uh, common area of interest. You may have heard of the islands that I come from. Uh, you may have heard of the great Brian Lara, the famous world cricketer. We're also known for our lovely beaches, uh, Carnival and Steel Pan. So let's get the ball rolling. Before we look at our radiographs of the abdomen, in the ideal world, we'd want to make sure that the animal has been fasted. This is to avoid artifacts created by stool and ingester in the GIT. Very often, though, the patients that come for abdominal radiology are already fasted because they often come with a history of anorexia, vomiting, and diarrhea. Standard radiographic views should be done. These would include orthogonal views, ventrodorsal, right and left laterals, and in some instances, the dorsoventral view. If we can... Uh, choose between doing a ventrodorsal or dorsoventral view, then the better of the two would be a ventrodorsal view. 
when the animal is in dorsal recumbency, the body weight will not displace the abdominal organs as it would if the animal was in a dorsal ventral view. Whether we're able to position the patient in a VD or DV would depend on whether the animal is amenable for, to such positioning. Unlike the thoracic area, we prefer to do expiratory views when we assess the abdominal cavity. This is to prevent the diaphragm from displacing the abdominal contents quarterly during inspiration. Before we move on to contrast specialized studies, it is always wise to look at your survey radiographs first. If we are trying to identify foreign bodies, very often radiopaque foreign bodies can be found on a survey radiograph, making it unnecessary to continue on to contrast studies. It is also wise to do survey radiology prior to doing contrast studies, especially if there is a high suspicion of GI perforations. And we'll talk a little bit about instances where certain contrast studies would be contraindicated. In the abdomen, we use a common term known as serosal detail. And this is a good idea that you assess the patient's body condition prior to interpreting your radiographs. If the animal is very thin, then you must recall that thin animals have very little abdominal fat. The presence of abdominal fat is necessary in order to differentiate between the different abdominal soft tissue structures that make up the abdomen. I'm just going to take us back to a familiar table that we would have seen when we did chemistry in our high school days to remind us about the radiographic density and appearance of the different tissues in the abdomen. The abdomen, we have tissues that are filled with air, for example, the GIT. We have soft tissue structures, for example, liver, kidney. We have uh, tissues that are filled with fluid, for example, the blood vessels and the urinary bladder. And then, of course, we have the surrounding bony parts of the abdomen. The reason that these different structures appear in different radiographic densities is because ultimately the elemental structure of the organ will affect the way the organs appear. So therefore, if we think of organs that have gas in it, such as uh, the stomach and intestines, and you think of the gases that may be present. So looking at your periodic table, we have hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. Looking at atomic numbers, you realize these are very low atomic numbers. Hydrogen have an atomic number of one. Nitrogen, seven. Oxygen, eight. Versus, at the extreme end, areas of the body where you have bone. So calcium has a, an atomic number of 20. Phosphorus, 15. So therefore, bone on a radiograph will appear white versus areas on the radiograph that would appear black because of the presence of air. Interspersed between these two extremes, we have fat and soft tissue. Fat has a very high water content. So this is why on a radiograph, fat is described as looking blackish, uh, gray, blackish gray in color versus soft tissue and, and fluid filled structures. Soft tissue and fluid filled structures, if we look at our atomic numbers, nitrogen, sulfur, you realize that they are lower than bone, but at the same time, the atomic numbers are higher than fat. Fat has a very high water content, so the difference between fat and soft tissue slash fluid is that soft tissue slash fluid would appear more white in comparison to fat. And we use this difference in atomic number when we look, apply our contrast studies. So we can do negative contrast studies where we use uh, room air or carbon dioxide. So in relation to the atomic number of soft tissue, you realize that when a negative contrast agent is used, it will appear black in comparison to the adjacent soft tissue. On the other side of things, we can use positive contrast agents. And here we have a photo of what barium sulfate looks like and iodinated compounds as well. These are considered positive contrast agents 
Because if you look at the atomic number of these two elements, iodine is 53, barium is 56. So in comparison to the, the tissues that make up the abdomen, your positive contrast agents are going to appear bright white. And we refer to these contrast agents as we move through this presentation. Getting back to some structures in the abdomen and the ability to see one soft tissue structure from the other, we must recall that the presence of abdominal fat, whether it is in the mesentery or the omentum or in the retroperitoneal space, will determine how well we visualize these body tissues. Also, if there is a marked difference between one organ and the next, then the difference in radiographic density or appearance of these organs can be appreciated. Luckily, within the abdomen, the GIT can have a mixture of gas as well as fluid and solid material, and this can help us identify certain segments of the GIT. When looking at radiographs, we consider the Ronjon signs. We consider whether there has been a change in the opacity, the margin, position, number, size, and shape of the structure that we are assessing. Some general terms that we use in assessing the abdomen. When we, we talk about a loss of serosal detail, we imply that there has been infiltration of the fat in the body by some sort of fluid or inflammatory process. So common examples and diseases where we would use the term of loss of serosal detail would be when there is ascites. Pneumoperitoneum is used to refer to the presence of free gas within the peritoneal cavity. Where can this free gas come from? Well, remember, if the animal has had abdominal surgery, you can have free gas for up to one month post-surgery. Also, if there has been some sort of perforation to the GIT and there are gas-producing organisms present, then the detection of a pneumoperitoneum is a significant finding. Well, how can we increase the yield of obtaining that diagnosis when we have a high suspicion? We can use the benefit of the cubital views. And on the right-hand side of the slide, I have an example for you. The animal is in a ventrodorsal position, and the cassette or the, the detector plate is placed on the lateral border of the patient. Depending on the laws in your country, you will know whether you are allowed to use a horizontal beam technique. So in this instance, instead of having a vertical projected x-ray beam, we come from a horizontal distance. What this allows is that if there is any free gas in the abdomen, the gas will rise to away from the recumbent surface. And if we can see here, you can see that there's a small cup of gas just under the ventral flow. If you are going to employ this technique to increase the yield of diagnosing a retro, a pneumoretroperitoneum, then let the animal be in dorsal recumbent for a minimum of 10 minutes to allow the gas to rise. Also, if you're trying to detect a pneumoretroperitoneum, it's a good idea to look at the diaphragm, because very often air will be trapped between the diaphragm and the liver. When looking at your radiographs of the abdomen, very often our animals exhibit pica, and therefore we can often detect radio opaque foreign bodies. As a veterinarian, it is for us to determine whether these foreign bodies are incidental findings or are they of significance. And then, of course, if there, you have masses tumors, and so on in the abdomen, it will cause displacement of the adjacent abdominal structures. So looking at these radiographs, starting from the radiograph on the left, an animal that has a very good body condition would provide lovely serosal detail so that we can differentiate the hepatic border from small intestinal loops, from large intestinal loops, you can go up into the retroperitoneal space, and if there is sufficient perirenal fat, we're able to pick up the borders of the kidneys. 
And then if there's sufficient peri uh, fat around the bladder, then you can also pick up the outline of the urinary bladder. Moving to the radiograph in the middle, animals that are just a few months old, juvenile animals, the yield that we get from looking at their abdominal radiographs is actually quite poor. And this is because juvenile patients have a high degree of brown fat making up the fat content of the abdomen. Brown fat has a very high water content. Recalling that water is a fluid and fluid has the same radiographic capacity as soft tissue. So therefore, in very juvenile patients, it would be very difficult for us to achieve sufficient detail because of the high water content of their fat. Instances like this, if we're trying to improve the technique, if we try to increase our KVP, MES, we, are, we would be quite disappointed, okay? Because the issue here is that the fat has too high a water content. Then we have the challenge of patients that are emaciated or very thin. These patients come into us with a very tucked up abdomen. These patients have very little abdominal fat. And because there is not sufficient abdominal fat, our ability to see and distinguish the different abdominal organs will be impaired because of this. Here we would be highly reliant on the presence of any gas within the animal's GIT. So assessing your expectation as a cirrhosal detail of the patient will help to guide you as to whether an abdominal radiograph is the correct choice in terms of imaging modality. So I want us to move through the GIT, starting with the stomach. And the stomach moves from, on a lateral radiograph, the fundus is found dorsally and the pylorus is found ventrally. On a ventral dorsal or dorsal ventral view, the fundus lives on the left side of the abdomen and the pylorus on the right. In a cat, however, remember that the stomach tends to sit more on the left side of the cranial abdomen. The appearance of the stomach on a radiograph will depend on the contents of the stomach. We can use the benefit of different types of ingester, gas, liquids, and solids in the stomach to redistribute based on recumbent positions. And we'll go into that in a little bit. So looking at this next slide, here we have a cross-sectional CT image at the level of the stomach. This patient is in a ventrodorsal position. It means that the patient's back is sitting on the table and the ventrum is away from the table. As we look at this patient, we identify the stomach. And the stomach is said to have this typical U-shaped appearance. Remembering that the fundus sits on the left side of the abdomen, the pylorus sits on the right side of the abdomen, and the body joins the two. Remember, if it is a cat, the stomach will sit solely on the left side of the abdomen. Another feature that this image shows us is that the fundus and the pyloric are not on the same horizontal axis. In fact, the fundus sits closer to the dorsum of the animal, whereas the pylorus sits closer to the ventrum of the animal. So just recapping, the fundus is gonna sit on the left side of the body, the pylorus sits on the right side of the body. The fundus sits more dorsally in relation to the pylorus. So if we have our patient in a dorsal recumbent position or VD position, then we can use the fact that air rises away from the dependent surface. So in this image, we can see that air is seen in the pylorus and the body, whereas the solids and, and liquids have settled into the animal's fundic region. Remembering that our radiographs are flat images, especially when we look at a lateral radiograph. A lateral radiograph is equivalent to us merging the left and right abdominal wall together. So therefore we take away the width of the abdomen. Should we do that with this image, it means that the pylorus now will move 
towards the ventral aspect while the fundus stays dorsally. Looking at the diagram adjacent to this, I just reiterate that in a normal orientation of the stomach, the fundus is located dorsally, the pylorus is located ventrally. And this is important for us to recall when we try to rule out the difference between a GDV and gastroparesis. So let's look at some survey radiographs of the abdomen to compare what happens with the different positional radiographs. So looking at this radiograph, remembering that we, we position lateral radiographs so that the vertebral column is on the top of the screen and the abdominal floor is on the bottom of the screen. We position it so the animal's head is always to the left side of the screen. And looking at these two lateral radiographs, we can make a general statement that this animal has very good serosal detail. We have the ability to distinguish the liver from the stomach, from the tail of the spleen, small intestinal loops, the kidneys in the retroperitoneal space, and the urinary bladder. For the moment, let us focus on the stomach. So we said that in a left lateral recumbent position, we expected that solids and liquids would move towards the left side of the body, remembering that the left side of the stomach is the fundus. And in this image, we could see the hot heterogeneous appearance of food and liquid material in the animal's fundus. And then ventrally, we can see that the air has risen away from the left lateral position to the right side of the abdomen. We mentioned that on the right side, that is where we expect to find the pylorus. So it is no surprise to us that we see this gas cap, and this represents the pylorus on the left lateral view. This is the same animal. All we did was change the recumbent position. In this case, the animal is now sitting in a right lateral recumbent position. But where would the solids and liquids go if the animal is in a right lateral position? It will go to the right side, remembering the pylorus is sitting on the right side. So this circular fluid-filled opacity represents the presence of liquids settling in the pylorus. The gas is expected to go away from the pyloric area, and this represents gas within the body and the fundus of the stomach. Looking at some contrast barium studies, we can also appreciate the difference on a ventrodorsal and dorsoventral in terms of distribution of liquids and gases in the stomach. One thing we notice that this is an image of a dog because we mentioned that the stomach, the fundic area sits on the left, the pylorus sits on the right. And then if we drew a line connecting the two, the stomach runs horizontally and perpendicular to the vertebral column. If the animal is sitting in a ventrodorsal position, it means that the liquid is going to go towards the animal's dorsum. Remembering that the fundus, we said, is closer to the dorsum than the pylorus, it is not a surprise that we see the, the barium has pooled in the animal's fundus and gas has risen into the animal's pylorus. If we put the animal in a dorsoventral position, this means the animal is in sternal recumbency, then the opposite happens. Now, air rises towards the dorsal part of the stomach. The dorsal part of the stomach is the animal's fundus. The ventral part of the stomach will collect the liquid barium. This image also highlights for us the presence of the rugae or gastric folds in the stomach. Remembering that the gastric folds are horizontal to each other in the fundus and the body of the stomach, but as you go towards the pyloric area, those folds become more concentric. And making the last point again about the stomach on a lateral radiograph, the fundus, we said, is dorsal, the pylorus is ventral. This is a left lateral recumbent position. Once again, the liquids will settle towards the left side of the stomach. And the left side of the stomach, we said, is the fundus. And the air would rise into the pyloric area away 
from the recumbent side. And this highlights a within the pylorus. Another feature that we can see on the lateral radiograph is we can identify the gastric axis of the stomach. And this refers to the angle of the stomach in relation to the vertebral column. So the normal gastric axis is that the stomach can sit in a position that is anywhere from parallel to the rib to perpendicular to the vertebral column. So therefore, the stomach can move in this fashion once it stays within that angle. So if we think of some things that can move the stomach or change the gastric axis, well, the most common thing is the adjacent liver. So if you have some sort of a hepatic mass, depending on which lobe of the liver the mass is, it can change the angle of the stomach. The other thing that can move the stomach or change the gastric axis is also whether you have a mass of the spleen. Remember, your spleen is running along the greater curvature of the stomach. So therefore, if there's any sort of displacement of the spleen, for example, splenic torsions, then we expect the gastric axis will move with the spleen. Likewise, if the stomach is empty, we expect that the stomach sits within the costal arch or the rib cage. So therefore, if the stomach is full, then it can push away from the rib cage, but it should maintain the normal gastric angle or axis. So looking at a couple of conditions that we want to be able to recognize uh, immediately, one such condition is the GDV, or gastric dilatation volubular syndrome, that we tend to see in large breed animals following uh, a big meal. So one big difference that we can notice if we compare the normal to the abnormal is that you have a change in position between the fundus and the pylorus. In this case, we can recognize the pylorus the pyloric canal has a uh, usual tubular appearance. Remember we said whether it is a left or right lateral recumbent position, the pylorus must always be located ventrally, not dorsally. So this, this, the change in position is an obvious Rongen sign where the pylorus is now dorsal and the fundus becomes ventral. But why is it that we don't see the rugae of the stomach? Well, if the stomach is sufficiently dilated, then the rugae become flattened. So you can't use the appearance of the rugae to help rule out or rule in a GDV. Another difference that we see, and especially if the rotation of the stomach uh, exceeds 90 degrees, is that the stomach will fold on itself. And we talk about the stomach exhibiting compartmentalization. And some other descriptive terms that we use is that the stomach takes on this typical reverse C appearance, or if anybody goes back to their childhood, we talk about C in the Popeye sign. Sorry, I don't have much of a Popeye sign. Okay. So we want to be able to recognize an animal with a GDV because this is a, a, an acute abdomen. This is a surgical emergency. We need to get in there and decompress the stomach. Compare the appearance of the stomach in a GDV versus this radiograph on the right-hand side. Nobody will dispute that this stomach is greatly distended. But did this stomach rotate? Well, this is a right lateral recumbent position. Recalling that in a right lateral recumbent position, we said that fluids and solids will settle into the animal's pylorus. Well, is, it, is this the case on this image? We look here, we can see, yes, this is the pylorus of the animal. There is no fold of tissue causing compartmentalization. And in fact, this gas cap that we see represents air in the fundic region. Uh, region sorry. So this is a, a nice example of gastroparesis, a dilated stomach versus a rotated stomach. As we continue along from the stomach, we move to the small intestines. 
And, and the common way of referring to the small intestines is that it makes up the packing material of the abdomen. And this is because you have almost three times the length of, of small intestine as the length of the patient's body. The only part of the small intestine that is relatively fixed is the duodenum, whereas the jejunum and ileum tend to be highly mobile and therefore can move anywhere within the abdomen. Just as we mentioned, the stomach and, and its ability to move in relation to disease adjacent to it, likewise, the small intestines will move in response to disease surrounding it. In dogs, we can see a mixture of gas and fluid in a normal abdominal radiograph. However, in a cat, when there is the presence of air, then that is an indication of anorexia. Because the small intestine is tubular in nature, when we see it in a longitudinal fashion, it should look like a tube. When we see it in a cross-section, it should look like a circle. Whether it is, as I said, filled with fluid or air will not change the appearance in cross-section or longitudinally. Also, the small intestine has peristalsis, which means that along its length, we should see some areas that are dilated and other areas that are relaxed. There are numerous ways to measure the small intestinal width. And one easy point of reference is using the second lumbar vertebra. So if we measure the central part of the, of the lumbar vertebra of L2 and compare it to the width of the small intestinal loop, then they should be comparable in size. And we often don't talk about dilated small intestinal loops until we exceed at least twice the measurement. Another common measurement that we use is the measurement of the bony part of a rib. Compare that to the width of the small intestine, and likewise, it should not exceed twice the part of a bony rib. There are numerous measurements to measure small intestinal width, so you just need to find one that uh, you are familiar with. The reason I choose the second lumbar vertebra is that the second lumbar vertebra is also used in the abdomen to measure other structures. In cats, because we don't have a big variability with the size of the, cat, the domestic cat, then on a true size uh, radiograph, the small intestinal width should not exceed 12 millimeters. But likewise, you can use a measurement, whether it is the rib width or the height of the lumbar vertebra, to determine whether you have small intestinal dilatation or not. There's some features that we see on contrast radiology that will indicate to us the, the position of the duodenum. Remember, the duodenum comes off of the pylorus and it will sit along the right abdominal uh, side of the abdomen. The duodenum of the dog has this typical crater-like appearance on the anti-mesenteric border. And we must not confuse this with a diagnosis of ulceration. These are referred to as pseudo-ulcers or false ulcers, and they, they are due to the lymphoidal infiltration of the duodenum uh, by an area referred to as the Pierce patches, if you recall our anatomy. This is the perfectly normal appearance of the duodenum in a dog. We also made the point that the duodenum in a dog tends to be wider than the other parts of the small intestinal tract. In the cat, the duodenum appears as a typical string of pearls appearance. So looking at this lateral radiograph of the abdomen, we can some of the Ronjan signs that we can identify would be that you have quite dilated loops of small intestine. And if we chose any of the measurements that I mentioned previously, in this case, I took the height of the central part of the vertebral body of L2 or the bony part of the rib, and they often use rib 10, and compared it to the width of the loops that I'm seeing here. We would find that the, these loops are quite dilated. Another thing that we notice is that is more than one loop, and we often look for, at minimum, of three 
dilated small intestinal loops. When we see these loops arranged in this fashion, we talk about intestinal loops having a sort of stacking or layering appearance. Another feature that we want to rule out is whether you're seeing any evidence of peristalsis. Are we seeing areas of contraction and dilation? In this instance, we are not. So we would be right to, to say that this animal probably has a diagnosis of a paralytic ileus. Now, when would this occur? Well, this can happen secondary to general anesthesia. So therefore, you have to know whether the animal is now coming out of surgery. And if that is the case, then just as the esophagus relaxes during anesthesia, so too does the small intestine. Other instances where we can see paralytic ileus would be in cases of infectious enteritis, such as parvovirus, or secondary to a toxemia. And now let's move on to the large bowel of the dog and the cat. These are examples of barium enemas. So barium can be used following an, an, a cleansing enema to highlight the position, location, and appearance of the colon. One difference we notice immediately between the appearance of small intestine and large intestine is that we have much less large intestine. In fact, the large intestine is described as looking like a shepherd's crook or a question mark. We can use the location of the transverse colon, which is this loop here, as a landmark because the transverse colon is the first loop of intestine that we see caudal to the stomach. We see this on the ventrodorsal view and we see this on a lateral view. So the first loop of intestine caudal to the stomach on either view is in fact the transverse colon. What are some other landmarks? Well, on the VD view, we can see the cecum, and the cecum we say also looks uh, C-shaped, and the ascending colon sits on the right side of the abdominal floor, and then it moves cranially to form the transverse colon, which runs from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. And then the descending colon runs along the left abdominal wall. In German shepherds and, and other large breeds, there's a condition known as the redundant descending colon. In these patients, they have an excessively long descending colon. And so... The, their descending colon may sit more towards the right-hand side. Is it pathological or not? No. And the descending colon, as it continues along the left abdominal wall, turns the midline and it passes through the pelvis as the rectum and ends in the anus. So therefore, the identifying the large bowel should not be too difficult because, as I said, it's, it's very specific in position, length, and appearance. One difference that we see between the dog's colon and the cat's colon is that we don't see a cecum. But the arrangement is the same. Running along the right body wall is the ascending colon. Running from ref right to left is the transverse colon. Running along the left body wall is the descending colon and running towards the midline and through the pelvis is the rectum. In this patient, the, uh, the cat ate quite a bit of its litter, so the barium has adhered to the litter. Another feature that we notice in the large bowel, just as we saw in the small intestine, is that we expect to see areas of peristalsis along the length. So one common condition that we see in the large bowel is the presence of an intersusception. So here we have the invagination of a portion of the colon. In this case, it's a transverse colon. And the portion that invaginates, we use the term that we see the intersusceptum. And the, it folds into the intersuscipians. 
the appearance of an interception gives you this typical coil spring or corkscrew like appearance. We can also see interceptions in response to chronic diarrhea, uh, where this common site in the small bowel would be the, the jejunum, the iliocolic junction, or in this case, the colon. Just moving back to talk a little bit about the appearance of the liver. The liver sits in the costal arch, but we have some breed variations that may affect the position of the liver. So in this example, this is a deep-chested dog, for example, a German Shepherd, versus an, a breed that has more of a barrel shape, for example, a Beagle. So therefore, once we reduce the depth of the abdomen, then the ventral border of the liver tends to extend beyond the costal arch. So therefore, in a German Shepherd dog, we expect that the liver sits well tucked within the costal arch, whereas in a barrel-shaped dog, we expect that we have some movement of the ventral border of the liver out of the costal arch. Another time where we can have the liver moving out of the costal arch is when we have rotation on our radiograph, when we have obliquity. Remember, when we are positioning our patient in a lateral recumbent position, we want to use wedges in order to cause the abdominal floor to become parallel to the vertebral column. If we forget to do that, then sometimes the ventral border of the liver will project beyond the costal arch. Well, how would we know whether this is pathological or not? Just look at the shape and the margin of the liver. If the liver is sharp and triangular in appearance, then that is a normal liver. Versus in this instance where the liver tends to be a little more rounded, and then we would say that this animal has hepatomegaly. Hopefully, everybody's recognizing the circular fluid-filled opacity as the pylorus of this patient, suggesting that the patient is in a right lateral recumbent position. The spleen is another organ that we typically see on our abdominal radiographs. So on this lateral view, we can see the tail of the spleen and the body, a part of the body of the spleen. The position of the tail of the spleen can be anywhere along the ventral abdominal flow. Whether we are able to distinguish the border of the liver from the spleen once again, it would depend on how much mental fat is present in the abdomen. On a VD or DV position, we can also find the head of the spleen located on the left side of the abdo abdomen, just caudal to the stomach. And hopefully we are recognizing that this is the fundus of the stomach that is filled with air. And here we see the triangular shaped head of the spleen. The radiograph on the right-hand side shows a spleen that has diffusely and general and, be, and has increased in size uh, diffusely. And this can happen secondary to general anesthesia. So therefore, this is iatrogenic splenomegaly. Another abdominal organ that we can pick up, depending on the amount of abdominal fat that is present, and in this case we're talking about fat in the retroperitoneal space, is the kidney. And in this instance, we are able to pick up both contours of the kidney. And we can safely say that this is a dog, because the kidney in a dog has this typical bean shape versus the kidney in a cat that has more rounded appearance. Getting back to measurements of uh, abdominal organs, we can use L2, the length of L2, to measure the size of the kidney. And we take the measurement from the cranial to the caudal pole of the kidney and compare it to the length of L2. There are standard ranges that we can use. In a dog, 
that range is two and a half to three times, three and a half times the length of L2. In a cat, the range is two to three approximately. So as I said before, L2 is, is a very good landmark in the abdomen to use to objectively assess sizes of different structures. In male intact dogs, we may or may not see the prostate gland. If the animal is middle-aged to geriatric, then the prostate tends to fall into the cordoventral part of the abdomen beyond the pubis. Our ability to see the prostate also will depend on how much periprostatic fat is present. If we happen to see the prostate on our survey radiograph, then we would see two piriform shaped organs in the cordoventral abdomen. And a common term that we use is we see the double bladder effect. We get the impression that the animal has two urinary bladders. So this is an example of a contrast retrograde urethrogram that was done on a dog with prostatomegaly. The contrast agent that was used in this case is one of the iodinated compounds. And now we can identify the prostate as the caudal piriform structure versus the urinary bladder that has been partially filled by the contrast agent. How can we objectively assess whether the animal has prostatomegaly or not? Well, we can use a measurement known as the sacral promontory to pubic measurement. Let me just take you to that area. So this is the sacrum here. So we're talking about this ventral triangular area of the sacrum. So on a true lateral radiograph, a line is drawn from the sacrum to the pubis. And this is used as your landmark measurement. Secondly, we identify the prostate gland. We can take a measurement parallel to this first measurement from the dorsal to the ventral border of the prostate. Or in instances where we can see the entire prostate, we can take the measurement running from the cranial to the caudal border. We then compare either of these two measurements to the sacral promontory to pubic distance. And these lengths must not exceed 70%. When that measurement is in is excess of 70%, well, we can safely say that this animal has prostatomegaly. Is that enough information to diagnose what uh, prostatic disease is present? Probably not, because we can get prostatomegaly due to several reasons, prostatitis, BPH, prostatic neoplasia, prostatic metaplasia. So we can also use, apart from the retrograde urethrocystogram identifying which of the two structures is the prostate gland, we can look for evidence of spillage of contrast agent into the prostate gland. This is known as extravasation of contrast. And on this radiograph, we can see that significant amounts of contrast has spilled into the gland, prostatitis. So if we go to the previous slide, we see that we have very little spillage into the prostate gland. So quite likely, the disease that is present is not sufficient enough to disrupt sig significant amounts of the prostatic ducts, so therefore we're thinking more of a benign disease, something like BPH. Another condition that we can use this retrograde urethrocystogram to identify is the presence of paraprostatic cysts. In this instance, we can see the contrast agent comes along, passes through the prostate gland, enters the urinary bladder, this is an example of a double contrast study, actually. And then adjacent to the urinary bladder, we can see that there's a presence of an abdominal mass. And remember, paraprostatic cysts often present as abdominal masses rather than masses within the prostate gland. 
the paraprosthetic cysts are remnants of the Mullerian duct that develop. So what are some other signs that we may see on a radiograph that would lead us to think that this animal has some sort of prostatic neoplasia, such as a adenocarcinoma? Well, you can have local invasion or local spread of the prostatic neoplasia to adjoin in bony structures. So in this instance, we can see that we have some bony exostoses on the ventral border of the last two lumbar vertebrae. Another area where you can get periosteal proliferation is along the pubis and the proximal femur. So seeing the presence of bony proliferation in the adjoining bony areas, seeing the presence of extravasation of contrast agent, putting the two things together, then neoplasia would have to be the top of, of our list of differentials. And then just to remind you that not only can we do positive contrast studies, but we can do negative contrast studies. And we have to remember in this instance that a negative contrast study using room A is contraindicated when we suspect any form of occult or overt hematuria, especially if it's a cat. So if you suspect bleeding within the urinary system, then please do not do an, a negative contrast study if you are using room A because the consequence of that is that you can end up with air embolism and death. Uh, to be cautious, you can, if you are doing a negative contrast study, put the animal in a left lateral recumbent position, fall, and then once you've completed the study, remove the air, elevate the caudal part of the abdomen, and leave the animal lying in a lateral recumbent position for at least half an hour, so that should there be any um, a emboli form, they are trapped in the right ventricle and dissipated. Okay. One instance where we may use a negative contrast study is when we want to try and identify radiolucent foreign bodies. So in this instance, A is injected into the urinary bladder to highlight the presence of radiolucent urolites. And then in the female, in intact females, we don't expect to see the uterus unless the animal is pregnant at least three weeks and beyond, or if there is some sort of pathology. With digital imaging, we have the ability to pick up the pregnant uterus at three to four weeks, and it looks like little marbles. Beyond that, the uterus will diffusely enlarge to just to be tubular and fluid filled, similar to what we see here, where we see folds of tubular fluid filled uh, horns. At 42 days and beyond, then the feti become mineralized. One other feature that we may see in the uterus is the presence of intrauterine or intrafetal. A. If we see that, then this is a positive indication of fetal death. Also, we may see the collapse of the bones of the skull, otherwise known as a spalling sign. So the presence of intrafetal or interuterine A, the presence of the spalling sign would be positive indicative, uh, uh, indicator sorry, of fetal death. So just to end things off today, I just thought we can probably look at a couple of cases uh, just to reinforce some of the, the, the things that we mentioned this morning. This first one is a case of an eight-year-old spade bitch that came in with a pendulous abdomen. So looking at the lateral abdomen, examining the bony parts of the abdomen for any uh, rongeon signs along the pelvis, the femur, uh, we have no physical abnormalities. We identify the ventral floor of the abdomen to make sure that it is intact. As we move to the cranial abdomen, 
we can identify part of the liver. Dorsal to the liver, we see air within the fundus of the stomach. As we move along, we mentioned that that first loop of, of intestine that we see, caudal to the stomach, is the transverse colon. Remember that we said small intestinal loops are the packing material of the abdomen, so really we expect small intestinal loops to occupy the entire mid to ventral abdomen. In this instance, however, we see almost like a dumbbell-shaped organ so with soft tissue opacity sitting on the floor of the ventral abdomen. This organ seems to be displacing the urinary bladder dorsally. Well, what is this organ? We only have two options, really. Based on our discussion this morning, we may think that this is the tail of the spleen, or is it part of the liver? Well, the liver is adjacent to the spleen on this radiograph, and it's not separated by any fat for us to see the borders conclusively. So in other words, this structure is causing body effacement of the liver. If this structure was associated with the liver, then what did we say would happen? Well, it should have changed the gastric axis of the stomach. We see that the gastric axis has not changed. So therefore, we're quite likely to, to assume that this has to be some sort of a splenomegaly and more specifically some sort of splenic ma mass rather than generalized splenomegaly. So what would be some differentials that we think of? Well, using a radiograph similar to an ultrasound, it is near impossible for us to say conclusively whether that is a hemangiosarcoma, splenic, uh, uh, not splenic uh, benign hyperplasia, hematoma, and so on. Okay. Moving on to the second case, this is an example of an intact 10-year-old male dog that came in with a history of tenesma, strangeria, and hematuria. So, uh, so certain differentials come to mind immediately. Some sort of prostatic disease, does the animal have some sort of cystitis, and so forth. Looking at our radiographs, remembering to go from outside in, we see that this patient has some ventral bridging or spondylosis, sclerosis of the end plates, and a very narrow disc space suggestive of chronic intervertebral disc herniation. Coming along, we look along the pelvis, look, and we look for any obvious uh, local spread or periosteal reaction or bony bridging, exostosis, and so on along your lumbar vertebrae. We look to see if we can discern a sublumbar lymph node. Remember, we don't see the sublumbar lymph node unless there is an issue with it. And then we notice in the abdomen, the caudal abdomen, there seems to be a very enlarged, uh, solid, soft tissue opacity in the area where we expect the urinary bladder. We then did a retrograde urethrocystogram using the iodinated compound. And this revealed that, in fact, that soft tissue density that we saw was indeed the prostate gland. If we just eyeballed it, doing our sacral promontory to pubic measurement against the sacral promontory to pubic measurement here, we would find that we, we way exceed our 70%. Did the contrast agents spill into the prostate gland? No. It is perfectly normal also that the prostatic urethra is wider than the urethra elsewhere. So we see this diffuse homogeneous enlargement, soft tissue structure, caudal to the urinary bladder. So number one differential on our list will probably be a BPH. Changing now to the, the queen, this is an example of a seven-month-old intact queen that came in with a four-day history of inaptance, vomiting, and abdominal pain. As we look at the periphery of this patient, the patient has sufficient uh, fat in the subcutaneous tissue, so therefore we're expecting that the animal should have sufficient serosal detail.
What is odd about the periphery of the patient is that instead of the cat having a funnel-shaped thorax, it instead, and we see some lower doses instead of kyphosis. Coming along in the lumbosacral area, we also see that similar appearance. Looking at the pelvis, we see that there are areas of uh, fractures that have not healed well. Also looking at the femur, you can see that there is a remodeling femoral fracture. So therefore, we're quite suspicious that some time in this kitten's life, it probably had some sort of traumatic event that re resulted in vertebral fractures, pelvic fractures, and, and the femoral fracture. Does that have any implication on, on this present clinical science? Well, let us investigate. So as we look at the DV, the left and right laterals, we see that this patient has very good serosal detail as we expected. We identify the stomach on the left-hand side. The stomach, we said, in a cat has this typical U-shaped appearance and it sits solely on the left side of the cranial abdomen. We see the liver of this patient sitting nicely within the costal arch and it has a nice sharp ventral border to it. So we're not suspicious of any sort of hepatomegaly. Using these positional radiographs, did the redistribution of air reveal any radiolucent foreign bodies to us? And no, it did not. Looking along the abdomen again on the left side, we can actually see the spleen of this cat. And this spleen seems to be a bit enlarged. Coming along, we see the left kidney, and we can measure it against L2, and that left kidney would fall within normal range. What we notice in this abdomen, however, is that the small intestinal loops seem to be positioned well towards the right side of the abdomen. Looking at our laterals, similarly, the small intestinal loops seem to be sitting bunched up in one particular area of the abdomen. Strangely enough, in cats that tend to have quite a bit of abdominal fat, it is actually normal for the small intestines to sit on the right side. So is this normal or abnormal? The next thing that we look at is to see, well, what are the types of gas shadows that we see? In longitudinal fashion, it seems to appear uh, tubular. Cross-section, it seems to be circular. But however, what about the size of these loops? If I measure them, compared it to the bony part of the rib, then we're probably exceeding twice the width of the bony rib. So we have some suspicious locations of the small intestinal loops. We're not quite sure whether uh, the small intestinal loops are enlarged or not. We have very good serosal detail in the abdomen, so we're probably not dealing with a perforation of the small intestinal loops or the stomach. So we thought it was safe enough to go ahead and do a barium series. So we gave the barium per os, and we have to have an idea about what is the transit time of barium through the GIT. So in a cat, we expect the stomach to empty more or less within three to five hours. We expect that barium should enter the duodenum within about 15 minutes. And we expect that within an hour, we should see barium entering the large bowel. So that being said, we seem to have some sort of normal gastric and uh, small intestinal emptying time. But what the barium reveals for us, however, is that the barium has adhered to this linear foreign body. And when you have a linear foreign body, it tends to cause the plication of small intestinal loops around that foreign body. So luckily, we were able to definitively diagnose a linear foreign body in this case. If we use barium to assess uh, transit time in a dog, the stomach tends to empty within five to six hours. Barium should appear in the duodenum within half an hour. Barium should get to the colon within three hours. 
And we normally say follow the barium for 24 hours, by which time it should be out of the colon. Remembering that certain drugs can slow your gastrointestinal motility, certain sedatives. Also, if the patient is anxious or nervous, that too can slow down transit times. This case is now an example of a five-year-old Great Dane male that had a six-week history of projectile vomiting and weight loss. When we look at these lateral abdominal radiographs, we immediately notice that we have very poor serosal detail. And is that due to the fact that the animal has lost a lot of weight? Or is it that we may have some sort of perforation? Can we find any other clues? So looking at in the cranial abdomen, we can see the ventral border of the liver, caudal to which we see this soft tissue fluid, distended organ that seems to be displacing small intestinal loops caudally and dorsally. We did both our right and left lateral views to try and redistribute the fluid and the solids in the event that we had any radiolucent foreign bodies and we did not notice anything abnormal. On positioning the patient, we also noticed that on a right lateral, most of the solids and liquids seem to settle in the pylorus and on the left lateral, air rightfully rose into the fundus. So therefore our suspicion of a GDV uh, would probably not hold. And then anyway, this history of a six, six week history, if it was a GDV, this animal would be dead already, unfortunately. What we noticed within the stomach, however, is the settling or retention of some mineral opacities. And in animals that have had chronic obstructions, partial or uh, uh, complete, you can have the retention of solid material uh, um, in the viscous, whether it is the stomach or the small intestine. And this is referred to as the gravel sign. So identifying the gravel sign is important because it gives you some idea of duration uh, or whether it's a partial or complete obstruction. Barium was given and it, it revealed what we saw on our survey that the stomach is not rotated in any fashion. But if you look at the timeline of this, this uh, uh, series, this is six hours later. You realize that we have no barium emptying out of the stomach into the duodenum. Also, we notice that the esophagus is also now filled with fluid, suggesting that you're getting the backflow of the gastric contents into the esophagus because the pylorus is unable to empty. So some differentials at this point would be uh, whether you have some sort of pyloric obstruction, neoplasia, hyperplasia, dyssynergia, spasms, and so forth. One has to be careful, though, when given contrast studies in animals that have some sort of uh, pyloric obstruction, uh, because you have the possibility that the animal may aspirate some of that barium into the lung. And perhaps I'll end off with this case. This is a 10-month-old puppy that we saw with, uh, a couple of weeks ago that came in with a history where the owner noticed that it was chewing on cloth and clothing and towels and it in fact vomited up pieces of, of a towel uh, two weeks prior. Unfortunately, when the puppy came in to us and we did our survey abdominal radiographs, you can see that this patient has very poor serosal detail because it had been losing weight within the last two weeks. Also, luckily, we, a lot of these loops were gas-filled to help us identify uh, intestinal structures. Apart from these gas-filled loops, you notice that you had this sort of heterogeneous appearance of material within intestinal loops and trapping of some gas bubbles around and in this material. Can we identify these loops? Are they large bowel? Are they small bowel? Can we trace these loops to any structures that we know? Well, let's start with the descending colon. So we could see that a similar type material is in the descending colon of this patient. If we look in the periphery, 
I, I hope that you can see that you, there are some metallic buttons or, or washers or something within this material. Then, if we follow that descending colon, can it link to a transverse colon anyway? Can we trace it to ascending colon? No. And then look at the shape of these gas loops that we see. They do not fit the normal tubular or circular shapes that we expected if we had normal small intestinal width. Also, we have too many of these loops to correspond to it being a large bowel. Well, luckily, we use positional radiology. So the benefit of taking the time to do two, your two lateral views, VD and D, DV, paid off in this instance. When we position the patient in the left lateral recumbent position, air redistributed within the in small intestinal loop to identify this soft tissue intraluminal radiolucent opacity that in, in fact turned out to be a bit of cloth. Unfortunately, when the animal went into surgery, there were several perforations in the small intestine and there were necrotic areas and the animal ended up being euthanized on the table. But just to remind you, take the time to do your three or four views because even though the, the stomach is the organ that we tend to think of redistributing fluids and air, that can also be applicable to the small intestine when you have a mechanical obstruction. On that note, I, I think uh, we're probably close to running out of time. I want to thank your, you for your attention. These are my acknowledgements, references, and I'll take any questions now. Thank you, Dr. Lahu. So, uh, Dr. Lahu, informed you on the excellent presentation. So, now we'll move on to the question and answer session. So, there are a lot of questions, around 287 questions have been asked. Uh, some questions are with the radio ultrasonography, out of which we have chosen the important questions and interesting questions. And uh, now I just present the questions. Sure. The first question is from Dr. Vijay Kumar from Chennai. What is the application of radiography in detection of early pancreatic disease? Right. Well, radiography, unfortunately, is not very sensitive for pancreatic disease. In fact, on survey radiographs, we tend not to see the pancreas uh, at all, unless there is an issue with uh, maybe mineralization or diffuse swelling of, of the pancreas. We may see the effects of the pancreas on adjacent tissues, such as the duodenum. We may get displacement of the duodenum or some sort of pyloric um, outflow abnormality. But unfortunately, radiology does not give us a good yield for uh, looking at pancreatic disease. And, and the better modality, of course, would be ultrasound. Thank you, Dr. Muru. You're welcome. Next question is from Dr. Jayalakshmi from Chennai. How to differentiate valvulus and intussusception in radiography? Yes. In the, sorry? How to differentiate valvulus and intussusception in, by radiography? By radiography. Okay, so I can probably, let me see if I can go back to um, our GDV slide. Good. So one uh, big difference that we see with a GDV is that we have, uh, on, remember we mentioned on a lateral radiograph, the stomach, the parts of the stomach are orientated in a specific way. 
So if I look at the one, this radiograph next to, to the one on the left, the fundus of the patient is always going to be dorsal to the pylorus of the stomach. It doesn't matter whether it was a left lateral or right lateral recumbent position. The challenge that we have in radiology is that we are looking at very flat images in the sense that we are looking at two-dimensional images trying to recreate a three-dimensional image in our mind. So this is the point I was making, that you must do at least two views at 90 degrees to each other to be able to identify the parts of the stomach. So the normal orientation is that the, the fundus of the stomach sits dorsal, the pylorus sits ventral. Right? When we have a GDV, we have a rotation along the axis of the uh, horizontal axis of the stomach. So therefore... If I keep it simple and say that if we had a 180 degree rotation, as it happened in this case, then you have an exchange of the parts of the stomach. So that the fundus now becomes ventrally located and the pylorus now becomes dorsally located. Well, how can I identify the pylorus from the fundus when you have this extreme gastric dilatation? Because remember I mentioned that one way of differentiating the pylorus from the stomach, from the fundus was that I could look at the direction of the rugae. Because the rugae in the fundus and the body tend to be parallel, whereas in the pylorus it tended to be con concentric. But when we have a GDV, because the stomach has folded on itself, you get this band of tissue that represents the stomach being divided into two distinct compartments. On a normal lateral radiograph, you will not see this band of tissue. The other thing is that it has this typical reverse C uh, appearance in a GDV. Versus an intersusception where you tend to think of more the telescoping of the intestinal loops, one folding into the other rather than a difference in uh, position. Yes? And then um, if you're not sure, I think I had a, a couple examples of, here we go, right? So we tend to think of intersusception taking place more within small intestinal or large intestinal loops. And you have this tubular enfolding of the one section into the other. So that the barium, if you gave a barium, would highlight that invagination of one into the next. We tend to think of GDV more in the stomach. We tend to think of intersusception more in small intestinal loops. So perhaps uh, I hope I answered the question. Thank you, Dr. Murali. Welcome. The next question is from Dr. Shiva Ramanujam from Chennai. Uh, what are the imaging procedures and interpretation for accident cases with internal bleeding in pets? Right. So. What we can pick up on radiology, so, I mean, of course, your patient presents in a certain way. So if the animal is dyspneic, then by all means, you're going to do your dorsoventral rather than a ventrodorsal view for the thorax because you don't want to compromise respiration by putting the animal on its back to start with. So a DV would probably be a smart way to go. And then if you can use the horizontal beam technique, put the animal in sternal recumbency, put the cassette to the lateral board of the, the patient and shoot with a horizontal beam. That would give you a lateral radiograph without causing the patient any distress by putting it on its side. And then, yes, do your dorsoventral view. If you're looking for a hemoabdomen, then likewise you can do the same views in do dorsoventrally as well as a horizontal beam lateral radiograph and you're looking for loss of serosal detail. But remember, bear in mind what is the body condition of that patient because if it was very thin to start with, it will look very similar to if you had some sort of chemo abdomen or uro abdomen and so on. So perhaps first ultrasound technique might be a better thing to use. Yes? And then if it is that you don't have ultrasound, well then use the horizontal beam again because fluid is going to settle, and you may be able to see a fluid line um, if the animal was in sternal recumbency and you use the horizontal beam. Yes? 
Thank you, Dr. Mutu. The next question is from Dr. Bampapati from Bangalore. Oh, what is the use of uh, wooden spoon method to improve the imaging of certain abdominal organs? In yes. The comments regarding this. Yes. Well, I think, with the, I think with the, the, with, with the availability of ultrasound and the ease at which uh, most clinics have both ultrasound and radiology, that we have kind of moved away from doing the wooden spoon technique. But, uh, but if, if same thing, if you don't have ultrasound in your clinic and you're trying to separate the soft tissue organs, one from the next, and the common parts that we tend to use that wooden spoon is if you're looking for a pyometra, right? So you're trying to move the bladder away from the uterine horns because we understand that the opacity of the uterine horn is the same as the opacity of the bladder. Or it's a very fatty animal. You're trying to reduce the thickness of the body part, perhaps, by using the spoon to separate um, the, the soft tissue organs one from the next. So it still is a valid um, tool to use because remember, wood is radiolucent and that will help to spatially separate uh, organs as well as reduce the part thickness to allow you to see uh, a better radiographic density of tissues. Thank you, Dr. Motu. You're welcome. The next question is, uh, what is low bar sign? Low bar sign? Yes, okay. Low bar sign is typically used in the thorax where we refer to some consolidation of a lung lobe or part of a lung lobe. Um, uh, most times we're thinking of like cases of low bar pneumonia. So we use a low bar sign description if we're trying to differentiate atelectasis or collapse of lung from pneumonia. Because in atelectasis, we have a loss of volume of the lung versus uh, pneumonia where you have replacement of air by soft tissue fluid and, and so. So the low bar sign um, refers to the appearance of, of a lobe or part of a lobe most times when there is a, a pneumonia. I hope that that's, that that's the question. Thank you, Dr. Motu. The okay. next question is from Dr. Chandrasekhar from Chennai. Use of radiography in gastrointestinal lymphoma and the clinical importance of iodine contrast in lymph nodes. Right. Okay, so uh, in lymphoma, so you do survey radiographs of the thorax and the abdomen. So perhaps it might be easier for you to pick up those enlarged lymph nodes in the thorax because we know specifically where those lymph nodes live in the thorax. And we have contrasts of air and lung around the soft tissue of an enlarged lymph node, yeah, apart from having peripheral lymphadenopathy. In the abdomen, likewise, is it a fatty animal so that I can differentiate an enlarged lymph node from other abdominal organs because we have so many lymph nodes in the mesentery and, and so on. Yes? So perhaps um, do your survey radiographs of thorax and abdomen so that you have a better yield of the suggestion of a generalized lymphadenopathy and relying only on your abdominal radiograph to detect lymph node enlargement. Yes? With regard to using contrast to identify the lymph node, sorry, I don't have any experience doing that. Ma'am, can you close your PPT? Sure. Or presentation? Sure. Does that help? Ah, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. The next question is from Dr. Sudhya Vamshi from uh, Sherwal Veterinary College. Yes. If there is a chronic mucosal ulcers or erosion of gastrointestinal tract, how can we diagnose via plain radiographs? Oh, that, that is hard because even with contrast uh, radiology, when you have a gastric ulceration, it's a difficult thing to, uh, uh, to identify on even contrast radiology because you have the challenge of, as he said, because entering into the crater and that it depends on how the primary beam hits the ulcer. So, may, so it could look like 
They talk about seeing a halo effect, suggesting that the, the Bairam settles within the crater and you have edema around the ulcer, or depending on the angle that it hits, it may look like a beak and, and things like that. But you have the challenge most times with gastritis. Um, you have a lot of mucus being produced anyway, and that could fill your crater and make you miss um, that diagnosis. So, so it's not radiology and contrast radiology. It's, it's not a great tool to help in diagnosing gastric ulcers, unfortunately. Not to mention the, the wonder of whether you have a perforation to start with and the risk of taking, of giving a barium to an animal with a potential perforation. The challenge with using iodine versus uh, barium. The, number one, the iodinated compounds are quite expensive. Number two, they are not very viscous. So if you're looking for iodine adhering to mucosa the way that barium does, it does not. And then as it moves through the GIT, it becomes diluted. So a lot of challenges with regard to relying on contrast radiology for ulcers. Unfortunate. Thank you, Dr. Mutu. The next okay. question is, uh, why cat duodenum appears as a string of pearls via contrast radiography? Yeah, so just so because you have lymphoidal tissue within the duodenum of both cats and dogs and humans and so on, right? And uh, so it, it is just what it is in nature that it looks like like uh, these balls are connected, you know, and you have peristalsis in the duodenum as you have in other parts of the gut. So it's just it's it's just is the way it appears anatomically, and we have to recognize it so that we don't think that the animal has some sort of strange foreign body in the duodenum. Thank you, Dr. Matu. This is oh. our last question. Sure. Uh, this is question is from Dr. Sarit Kumar from Sambalpur. So please explain in detail about radiographic examination of osteosarcoma. But of course, no, this oh. is not related to this. But they have asked a question. That's okay. Uh, detail about the radiographic examination of osteosarcoma. Yes. Uh, well, uh, probably the, if we, we play the probability game, we have specific locations for osteosarcoma. So the common saying is that it occurs large breed dogs, right, uh, at, uh, is bimodal, young and old, and away from the elbow towards the knee. So location and signal months, I suppose, will guide us as well. On the radiograph, Osteosarcoma lesions of the limbs tend to be monostatic lesions. They occur one in a long bone. Yes? And then you're looking at, so apart, so you look at the signal month location, the presence of the lesion in one or more long bones, then look at the effect on the periosteum. The periosteum has a, a typical erratic, speculated, uh, interrupted sunburst at, at the extreme appearance and look at the bone adjacent to the periosteum, you tend to have significant osteolysis of the adjacent bone and tends to be in the metaphysis of the long bone, right? So I'll come and the, and the transition from normal bone to abnormal bone is a long one. It's difficult for you to identify normal from abnormal. You have a lot of soft tissue swelling, right? So the, the signs tend to be very dramatic, versus benign bone lesions that may affect the periosteum in some form, but they tend not to do anything to their underlying adjacent bone. Yes? Thank you, ma'am. Thank You're you, welcome. Dr. You're welcome. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. You're welcome. Have a good day. Yeah. And thank you, Dr. Natasha, and uh, the uh, moderators for posting a list of questions. Now, may I call upon Dr. K. Krishnakumar, Professor and Head, Department of Veterinary Gynecology and Arthritis, for a proposing word of thanks. Good evening and good morning to all. It's my privilege to quote the word of thanks for this Global Veterinary Imaging Sciences webinar series. I thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. C. Paul Chandran, for permitting us to conduct this series of webinar. I am thankful to the guest speaker, Dr. Nadasa Muto, for sharing her knowledge and experience on the abdominal radiographic images for the benefit of our students and faculty. I thank the organizing secretary, 
and our director of clinics dr s balasubramanian for arranging this thoughtful program and also to guide and coordinate this program i must thank the dean madras veterinary college chennai dr k n selvakumar and the deans of the constituent colleges of uh, tanwas for their kind cooperation to conduct this program i would like to thank dr nagarajan hod clinics dr vijay kumar hod vuph dr arun prasad for their coordination uh, <coughs> hod rio section for their coordination to conduct their this webinar i acknowledge the technology support provided by mr karnanidhi senior vice president and dr sandosh alambic pharmaceutical for arranging the series of webinar i would like to thank dr vimal rajkumar dr tirunavukarasu for the arrangements of audio visual aids to conduct the program efficiently i would like to thank all the participants from all over the world thank you one and all thank you thank you please join uh, as tomorrow for the gastrointestinal ultrasonography in small animal practice 6:30 pm ist